Welcome to the 3-0 Show, part of the Athletic Baseball Show. It is Thursday, July 14th. Derek Van Riper, Bertrolli, Eno Saris here with you on this Thursday. On this episode, we have breaking news out of Toronto, where Charlie Montoyo has been relieved as the Blue Jays manager. We've got a segment called Bubble Bobble. We're going to take a look at teams that are mostly in second place or in the wild card race and figure out what they should do at the traded line. Should they buy? Should they sell? Should they hold? Also got a couple home run derby related thoughts that we're going to try and squeeze in later on in the show as well. But let's start with the big news that broke minutes before we started recording here. Midday Wednesday, Charlie Montoyo out as the Blue Jays manager. Britt, why would they make this change right now? I know the Blue Jays have underperformed some lofty expectations as the All-Star break approaches, but this doesn't seem like a a tactically flawed team that had to make a change like this. No, I don't have an answer for this. I was just looking at it and you know, they're two and eight over their last 10 games. So obviously I haven't been playing great uh, 46 and 42 as it stands. As we take this on Wednesday morning, they're in fourth place in the American league East, but you look at it and Tampa Bay in second at 47 wins. So this, everything is very condensed here between the Orioles who we'll get to later in the show and the second place race, we're talking about three wins. So I don't really see this as being a move I understand. Um, my first thought was like, look at what the Angels did with Joe Madden and their winning percentage has been atrocious since. Mm-hmm. It is not always the shot in the arm that people think it is. My my main thing that I always think about with these random firings that we don't expect is, was there a philosophy, a philosophy difference, right? Was there... Was Ross Atkinson Montoya not on the same page? Did they not get along? Because it seems like most of the time when the front office and manager are in lockstep, those are not the in-season firings, right? Those are the ones that the guy fights for, the GM fights for, and in the winter and the off-season, there happens to be a mutual parting of ways or a nicer way to put it. So my first thought is, is Montoya um, and the front office not on the same page? But again, this is all speculation on my part. Yeah, it's it's strange. He's been there, so he's been there for three years. That's that's long for a manager. I mean, that's above average, at least, uh, with how quickly people cycle through. We do have the Phillies as maybe an example of you know a shot in the arm working this year, um, and maybe that's it's about the players relating. Uh, in that case, they went to uh, a younger manager that maybe the players related to better. I don't think that's necessarily the case with Charlie Montoya. Here's a weird thing that I don't know if it means anything, but the Blue Jays have twice as many ejections as the second place team this year. They had a hitting coach ejected at giving the lineup cards, you know, this year. So hard to do. Yeah, like the game hadn't even started yet, dude. So uh, I don't know. This is a little bit of pop psychology and maybe it's useless, but like you have that many ejections. It seems like you guys are, it's tight. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not like a loose situation. It's uh, it, it's uh, it's stressful. People are stressed out. That's why they're yelling and getting kicked out of games and stuff. And they're it also maybe like searching for that spark, if that's the idea. Um, but you know the numbers uh, in this situation just say that the the Blue Jays are just underperforming just a little bit when it comes to runs scored and just a little bit when it comes to runs allowed. Their pitching should be a little bit better going forward. Somebody like Barrios striking out 13 uh, Phillies in six innings the other day. That could yeah. be that could be meaningful because if you've got Barrios and Gossman and Stripling all going, uh, it doesn't matter as much what Kikuchi is doing. And you've got at least three or four guys in the rotation. The bullpen seems fine. And then that lineup just seems like it's a week away from being the lineup we all thought it would be. I, I, I think the... The uh, Tapia uh, trade was maybe not their best move, but it's still a lineup that scored a lot of runs last year, you know, with minor differences. And Santiago Espinal has been a a fine for them. So uh, this is a lineup that should be scoring more runs. I don't think it's Charlie Montoya's fault. I mean, no, it, no. If, if you guys care about contract wise, he just got extended, if you remember, in April. But it's still yeah. the last year of his deal, right? So that no, it wasn't. He was set to end the last deal. He's now would be signed through twenty twenty three when they agreed on that deal. Oh, April. okay. And that so they extended that, him a couple of years. So they extended him one year in April. It was set set to 
go at the end of this year. They extended him one year, so it was set to go. They're paying him through the end of 2023. So he wouldn't be a lame duck, yeah. Yes, and it had options for 24 and 25. So again, I'm just wondering, like, what that was in April. Now and then? We're in yeah. July. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something, something doesn't seem quite right here. And again, this story just broke literally 10 minutes ago before we yeah, started Ken recording. Rosenthal. Ken Rosenthal had it on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. Rose so bomb. we might know a lot more by the time people get to listen to this podcast on Thursday that explains some of the story. And it might take a bit longer for all of the story to come out. But the Jays have the fifth best offense in the league by WRC+. Plus. They're still a very dangerous and productive offense so far their pitching is good right their rotation i think is 11th in war they have the one flaw in the back with you say kikuchi right now that's about it that's a good situation to be in at the all-star break the bullpen is a weak spot right now but that's a pretty fixable thing when you've got young talent when you've got resources to spend more so you could see that being a pretty easy thing to upgrade at the deadline and just to wrap it all up just for a moment like look at this blue jays team they have an 82.8 percent chance of making the playoffs at the time of this firing according to fan graphs and a five percent chance of winning the world series which doesn't seem like a lot until you realize that the yankees the astros the mets the braves and the dodgers are the only teams that have a greater percentage chance of winning the World Series by that same set of projections. So they're the sixth most likely team to win the title as things stand right now. So clearly there's something else going on here that is just not immediately clear. Yeah, that's why I said like these in seasons are always so weird, right? It's always like, what do we not know? Because especially with a good team, what what's going to change here from firing? As Eno said, it's not Charlie Montoya's fault. What is going to change? What's going to make them all of a sudden chase down the Yankees? Nothing. And I think you can give credit to teams like the Braves, and I know they're coming off the World Series, but you know, there was never really like a fire Ryan Snicker, but they underperformed for a good chunk to start the season. Now look at them, they're in lockstep with the Mets. Um, I just wonder how much of this is just knee-jerk reaction um, by organizations when things just don't go their way. Also, the Blue Jays have the easiest strength of schedule of the five teams in the AL East for the rest of the season, winning percentage of their remaining opponents 489. So an easier path than the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Rays, and the Orioles, relatively speaking, even though they'll see plenty of those teams going forward. So probably a lot more to come here. But one thing that's made the AL East a little more compelling this year, we'll kind of talk about them as a bubble team now, the Orioles. I mean, they're red hot right now. It probably changes what they're willing to do at the trade deadline maybe they sell less maybe they actually find ways to make a few improvements for the long run and just see what happens because mathematically they're in the thick of the playoff race they are actually no, they're not they're wild card contenders yes, they right are. Now. They, <laughs> they've got a two percent chance of making the playoffs hey you know they have a I'm better record than the, the white the sox they yeah. have a better record than the chicago white sox they're in a tougher division they they're in a tougher division chance. doesn't they're matter not the wild card well, here's the thing. So you're telling me they have a chance. They have a chance. They, they at least have a chance because they're playing so well right now. It, it's, it's a 2% chance of making the playoffs. Three wild cards in the AL this year, of course. But they're right there with the White Sox, the Guardians, the Mariners, and the Rangers yeah. in terms of record right now. They're in that group. And we thought they'd be down in the basement with the Royals and the Tigers and the A's. So far, they're not. Oh, the Angels are in the basement too, by the way. I'm, I'm putting them there. They are, they're <laughs> down there. It, it stinks, and they're down there. Well... I think the interesting thing with the, the the Orioles is they don't really have that much to sell. You know, like uh, when it comes to uh, people that are going to be free agents next year, it's Trey Mancini and Jordan Lyles, right? And I'm not trying to poo-poo them. Those are both interesting players and maybe they could trade them. But they're not the types of players that uh, will get you a huge return prospect-wise. So, you know, you're just not to, for a corner bat like Mancini, who doesn't really give you defensive value. And for like basically a number five or a back-end starter like Jordan Lyles, you're just not going to get the type of prospect that moves the needle. So if you decide to keep them and just play the season out, you don't actually hurt your organization that much. You're giving up on a possible reliever or something, you know, <laughs> like you're not, you're not, uh, you're not about to go get a top 10 prospect for, even if you put Lyles together with Mancini, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get really, I think a top 50 prospect back. So just keep them and go for it, I guess. Thank you. You know, I wrote, um, for yesterday, was he yesterday? Yeah, yesterday, today's Wednesday. I wrote for Tuesday that they shouldn't trade Trey Manzini because of this. It mm -hmm. is not a franchise altering move. They're not going to get back anything but some prospect that would probably top out at A ball. 
So in my mind, in my view, why not give them a little hope? And also, why not teach these young guys, even if they don't make the playoffs? I think what people don't realize, and you really don't see it unless you're on the beat or you're in these clubhouses every day, is like these guys need to learn how to win. It's an important skill to play meaningful games in August and September. When you talk to players who haven't been there before, it's exhausting. It's a different mindset. So maybe the Orioles don't go anywhere this year, but maybe these young guys learn – how to win, how to compete, how to not be like, oh, we're just going to get a big series against the Yankees in September, you know? Yes, Play spoiler. exactly. Yes, the, like the, I think those are important things to learn, and I think Trey Mantini is a big part of that because he's really one of the last links to the previous regime. He came up in 16 when they went to the playoffs. Like He wasn't there very long, but he was still in a system, in an organization at a time when they were good, when they were expected to compete, and you just can't put a tangible – a quantifiable number on that. It's funny. Remember, Freddie Freeman was there when the Braves were bad. And he was kind of there when the Braves were good, the Braves were bad, and then he was there when they won the World Series. So that was kind of a such a cool moment. You maybe maybe extend Mancini if it's not going to cost them that much. And the other thing that, that I think is interesting to um, the Orioles is, and I hate to always be the numbers guy, but the only thing correlated to uh, increased attendance is winning. Yeah, and people talk about oh, big free agent, oh, big prospect. Those the, the the bounces you get on attendance with those are tiny and maybe on a one game basis. The only thing that gets you more butts and seats is winning, and the only thing that can get the Orioles more money to spend, perhaps. I mean, they used to spend at a greater rate than they are right now, but the only way to sort of maybe convince ownership now is the time to start spending on free agent is to have some more butts and seats and have some more income that way. So. You know, at some point in any rebuild, you have to just be like, okay, now we're going to try and start to win. Now we're going to, you know, even if we only go 500 this year, this will be the point we plant the flag and we say, this is the year we went 500. And next yeah. year we try to get better than that. And, and maybe it's a bit like the Seattle arc, right? You've got young players that have taken a big step forward in the minors this year. Some of them are going to be ready to help next year. Gunnar Henderson, sort of leading that group, help the Grayson Rodriguez. Like we, we know they have that wave coming, but I wonder if at the deadline, if they if they're still in this position a couple of weeks from now, they could hit they could hit the skids and be bad enough, and it would just make sense to say, "All right, fine, we'll take the prospect for Mancini and and move on." Like they could they could fall into that, but they could also be the kind of team that says, "We're not spending money. We can take other teams' salary dump players, not give up any long term value in return, and just see what happens that way." Like if you want to say, "Let's put Mike Mustakis on a different team," well, okay, the Orioles could probably take on Mike Mustakis if the Reds want to eat some of that money and maybe or, they can even find ways to get some young talent yeah. back with salary that they're willing to eat. The Padres are maybe a million dollars away from the luxury tax and don't want to be in the luxury tax. Maybe you get a prospect by just picking up some money from them, you know? Yeah, totally. And like in, in my view too. So in this Orioles team reminds me of 2011. It was like the year before the Orioles got good and that trade deadline, the Orioles, traded Koji Uehara, who was a reliever who had team control left. And so I think their best bet might be to look at a guy like Jorge Lopez, who has team control, who a lot of teams would give up stuff for. And they got back in that trade, Chris Davis and Tommy Hunter. Those were two key pieces that helped push them into the, like, hey, we're good now in 2012 that no one saw coming. In 14, and they ran away with the ALE. So why couldn't they – Keep these guys who aren't good. They're not going to get much for these pending free agents. Trade away a Jorge Lopez and kind of accelerate their timeline because no one expects them to be good next year. Why not get back real tangible pieces rather than just saying, oh, we're just going to trade everybody that is going to leave in two months anyway. That might yeah. be the best play for them. And and team control is the currency. So for a team that is acquiring Jorge Lopez, they can say we get into a stretch run and next year. Um, and so that's they will they might actually give up more. It's funny because he's a reliever and Mancini's an everyday player, but there is that team control aspect. Uh, also, they are set up in the bullpen. Felix Bautista is. Uh, a god among men i mean this guy is huge he looks like a linebacker and he's got the most ride in baseball on his four seam uh and he throws it in the high 90s and uh just got an awesome change up off of that so i, I mean they've got a replacement in hand and i think they even have a set of replacement in hand so i i think that bullpen wouldn't hurt too badly and it would be maybe that's the that's the move to do right there yeah and maybe you could combine it because uh the uh the 
the Padres might be looking for some bullpen help. And, you know, maybe you can take Will Myers off their hand, uh, give them Jorge Lopez and get something better than you expected back. And maybe it's it's even more complicated where it's like Anthony Santander goes back to the Padres because he's cheaper than Will Myers, but you're getting prospects on the Orioles side that make you better next year. I, I think there's lots of ways this can work. The one thing the Orioles really struggle with, it's not actually starting pitching as much as you think. They're kind of league average in terms of what kind they've of done hitting. as a rotation. They need bats. They got a 92 WRC plus as a team, 24th in Major League Baseball. I know they've played most of the first half without Adley Rutschman. He certainly helps, but Adley Rutschman alone is not going to make that an above average offense. He might get them closer to a league average sort of number. So finding another core young bat that they don't currently have via trade and then bringing more bats up next year could be the way they get a lot better pretty quickly. So it's fun to see a team like this make it a little bit earlier and then get into the fray as a team that can be more of a wild card when it comes to the trade deadline. But this show was built originally around teams like the Padres. Padres are seven and a half back in the NL West behind the Dodgers. Second best record among the non-division leaders in the National League in a good spot. 88.7% chance of making the playoffs, according to Fangraphs. We're feeling good about the Padres right now. And they've got Except a lot for Padres of fans are not feeling so great. They, no. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're whole miserable. They're Why? white knuckling the side. They're white knuckling um, their, their Because their of chairs. last year? They're no. worried because of last year? No, yeah, I, I, mean, I don't know. Of it. I don't know. I can only speak to my family who lives in San Diego. But, but like they were so close to the Dodgers and then losing that three of four, just like since then, it's been like the negative, all aboard the negative train, right? Like, um, you know, you got Tatis that's still not back. That division that was very close has widened, right? I think they thought they could overtake the Dodgers and they still can. Um, but you're now clearly in a secure wild card spot. And the way that that series went with the Dodgers was. I don't know. Not ideal. I and guess. I think you also just have the ghosts. Ghosts exist, you know, when it comes to baseball. The ghosts of last year is still still haunting them. You know, oh my gosh, it's <laughs> happening again. You know, and that's that's one thing that you have to beat. That's actually one thing you have to beat through when you're when you're a rebuilding team coming out is like we've been bad forever. We're just going to be bad again soon. You know, just just wait another month. You know, and yeah. so the Padres have to they over the last few years they've been better and better and better and they they're pushing those boundaries and and you can see it in the attendance you know it, the, those those parks used to be more filled with giants fans when the giants were in town they used to be you know kind of half empty and now they're 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 roaring with fans so they're getting them to believe longer into the season it's going to be you just keep pushing and pushing till you make it to the promised land i guess and i think for them they just really need a power bat you know, I think a power corner corner type bat is what they need because they have a bunch of relievers coming back in Morahan and and Pierce Johnson and Stephen Wilson. They have a lot of really good relievers that are on the mend. And as those guys come back, I think the bullpen gets better. They have good rotational depth. Their their offense is not that good. They still have twelve more games against the Dodgers this season. So the Padres opportunities to make up that gap if it stays around seven games they've got plenty of head-to-head -head opportunities to do it and i think Eno pointed this out last week it wasn't like they got blown out in all those games the gap between these two teams it's significant but it's not insurmountable the padres offense just below league average so far dodgers of course top three offense right starting pitching Actually, fairly close to even Dodgers, slightly better so far this season. Bullpens are comparable. The Dodgers are a better defensive team. They're tied for second in defensive runs saved. Padres are just a tick above average. But they've done all of this without Tatis. And yeah, it might be another month before Tatis is ready to play in games again. But that's a big boost for them. That takes that league average offense and pushes them to like a 105 range sort of offense, plus whatever else they're able to find at the deadline, I think could also make them a lot better. The cornerback, like Eno said, that shouldn't be the kind of thing you can't find. They've got major league ready trade chips. They've, they clearly don't like Luis Campusano as much as I do. So they have a catcher who could start for a lot of teams that they could just give up for the cornerback that they need. Plus a lot of prospect depth still other they young have a, players, a pop-up yeah. prospect that just came up Esther Ruiz that's playing. He could help them a little bit when it comes to the defensive aspect, because he's a guy who plays center, but also plays right and left. They can, he could be like the defensive replacement uh, and improve their defense there. Cause Noam Mazzara is uh, not a great corner outfielder. 
Uh, Jerickson Profar is okay, but he's he's hurt right now. So I the one trick that they have to pull, though, since they aren't great defensively and since they already have Eric Hosmer and uh, Luke Voigt on this roster, is they have to get a power bat that can play the outfield. I think that's the, that's the, the, the Neil they have to thread. Or... Or Eric Hosmer is leaving town, you know, or that, you know. So, uh, but I don't. I, there's still a lot of money left on Hosmer's deal. I don't think that's happening. So, uh, that's why I like Josh Bell for them uh, more than Mancini or Nelson Cruz, because Josh Bell, I think, can play the outfield. He's Oof. he's not. It's not amazing, uh, but I think he's a better outfielder than Mancini and Cruz. I mean, I don't think Cruz should be in the outfield. No, Nelson Cruz should have stopped playing yeah. in the outfield like five years ago. I mean, Barrett, I don't know if he, I don't remember the last time he actually did it, but he he looked bad in the outfield. I think it was about five years ago. I saw an interleague game where he played. I was like, oh, this this is <laughs> this is over. This is this is not a defensive player anymore. I think the other problem the Padres have to deal with is something that Dennis Lynn wrote about for the Athletic a few days ago. They have to deal with the luxury tax penalty. They have to consider whether or not they're willing to pay that. I think they'd be a second time offender. So it's a steeper penalty for them. And they're like hundreds of thousands away from it. Like they're, they're, they're right, right on, up it. on it. Yeah. So yeah. that's where the, you know, the Orioles stuff we were talking about before a team that underspends might be able to take back some of their salary, get better than what they have on their roster with some of those players, but then also get an upgrade for some younger talent that they want. And it's interesting that one of Dennis's, um, ideas was that the Padres could trade for Luis Castillo. They could trade one of their current starters and then go out and trade for Luis Castillo, which all points to AJ Preller being very caffeinated at the trade deadline, which is not a new thing (laughs) whatsoever. Which is on brand. (laughs) AJ Preller might not sleep between now and, you know, midnight on August 2nd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is a team that can get a lot better with a couple of moves. It's just going to have to be a lot more creative because of, of those restrictions how do you look at the situation in san diego compared to something like seattle where you're further behind the division leader you're 12 and a half back of houston you've got a 45 percent chance of making the playoffs so you could look at the astros and say okay it's, it's far-fetched to probably catch them they'll play seven times between the all-star break and the august 2nd trade deadline though so you might just learn a lot more about your team and how aggressive you want to be based on how those two series and the one with the rangers play out leading into the deadline itself i mean you know if you're in seattle shoes do you need more information before you know exactly what you want or do you feel like regardless of outcome you've you could set a reasonable course right now and start to follow it i think you they, they are going to lose some players at the end of the season and carlos santana you know was just a a, a rentals type situation so that's not uh, a, a huge deal for the health of the organization going forward. Ken Giles and Chris Flexen, they have options. Uh, you know, if they want to keep them around, they can. They are going to lose Mitch Hanniger, uh and Adam Frazier. Now, they've not had Hanniger, so maybe you could just say they know what they are without Hanniger. Uh, but he's also an important part of, you know, sort of lengthening the middle of that lineup. He's their best power source uh, when he's healthy. So, uh, getting him back in the lineup and seeing what they could do for a couple of weeks, I think might be meaningful because yeah. then you know a little bit more about what you can be this year and whether or not you need to sort of extend Hanniger or what you need for next year. And, and just frankly, what you need, you know, what you need now and future um, is it, going to come more into focus. I think if Hanniger is playing. Yeah. Some uh, quick breaking news. We were talking earlier about Charlie Montoyo, the blue Jays officially announced it. And bench coach John Snyder has been named the interim manager through the end of this season. Um, Casey Can- Candeli, I feel like I probably butchered that. Candel. Uh, Candel has been appointed interim bench coach for the rest of the season. So pretty standard moves there all around. But um, there'll be another team. There'll be a lot of teams looking for managers this winter. You know, it's kind of strange. Just one quick thought on that how awkward would it be to bring in someone who wasn't already on staff to fill a midseason vacancy? It's such a good job that if you were, if you were a managerial candidate who would be interested in this position at the end of the season, wouldn't you be interested in possibly just parachuting in right now and trying to put the pieces together on the fly? Or is it just too difficult to get on the same page with the existing holdover coaches 
and to also connect with the players that quickly. I mean, is that is that too much of an ask? Because it's always someone who's already there filling these spots. Yeah, I think it's a little bit like why people don't love acquiring catchers midseason. It's like, yeah. the, you know, you welcome to our team. Uh, you got to spend the next couple of days all nighters trying to figure out what our what our pitchers do. <laughs> you know? um, I think that I think that is I think it's difficult, you know, yeah. because spring training is really when you make these bonds. Spring training is is low pressure mostly. Uh, I know people are getting cut and they want to make the team, and there's there is some pressure. But in terms of the daily vibe in spring training, that's when you can really get to know your players. You you know the schedules are more lax. You can you can even have dinner with them, and you know what I mean. Like there's different there's different ways to connect with your players. If you just parachute in, like you said, uh, they were going to be like, who's this guy? And then, yeah. you know, the monkey sphere, right? The monkey sphere is it doesn't matter how old the monkey is. It matters how long the monkey has been in the in the group. <laughs> yeah, the whole thing is kind of weird. Like I was the angels were just in, in, in town and I was talking to someone in that organization about how weird it was to just all of a sudden not have Joe Madden. Right. And he's like, well, there were two guys that were clearly petitioning for his job in spring training. You wonder if that was the case with the Blue Jays, right? When things were starting to go bad, we're going to hear now about how he lost the clubhouse or whatever else we may that may come out from all of this. Um, and you wonder how much behind the scenes petitioning is going on. This is a very cutthroat industry. You bring guys in on your staff, but you're right. Those are the guys who often get to stick around when you get fired. So <laughs> I wonder how much behind the scenes, you know, petitioning or players, um, we're kind of pulling for other guys that was going on in Toronto. I'm still staring at this Seattle team and I'm looking at the <laughs> side by side comparison <laughs> with the Astros Astros Oof. second best offense in the league. Seattle's top 10 offense as they're currently built, which I think is a, a surprise. They are a step ahead of where people expected them to be coming the season, especially if you told me three, four months ago, if you'd said, Hey DVR, the Mariners are a top 10 offense this year. I would have said, was Julio Rodriguez must be up and he must be good. And Jared Kelnick probably took a step forward. And nope, Jared Kelnick's at Tacoma right now. And you could look at Kelnick and argue that he's actually their best major league ready-ish trade ship. I, mean, I don't know what else he's going to prove at AAA. Keith and I talked about this a little bit last Friday on the pod. But I wonder if they'd be willing to make a move like that. If it were most other front offices, it wouldn't even really cross my mind as something they would do. But because it's Jerry Depoto. Trader Jerry. Everything's out there for Trader Jerry. You, you can't you can't sit here and say that Kelnick is is untouchable. So I, I look at this team and I think their bullpen is underperformed. We talked about the Twins last week as a bullpen that when you look at the names and, and the performances you expected, you could find a handful of guys that you thought were going to be better in the second half. I think the same holds true for the Mariners. They're a bit healthier in that group as well. So I think they could end up having a really good bullpen in the second half. Rotation depth is the huge concern there. Like This is another team... You want to have some fun putting Luis Castillo on a team that would benefit from him not only this season, but obviously next season as well. I think the Mariners are pretty high up on that list because you could look at that rotation with some combination of Robbie Ray, Logan Gilbert, Luis Castillo, and George Kirby and feel really good about that first four. I think one other issue you have this season, George Kirby's innings restrictions are probably going to be a factor down the stretch. So aside from getting an upgrade in the rotation, you might need one more bulk start or two if you're going to make a run at it. One thing that is starting to happen in Seattle, though, is I feel like the cupboard is starting to be bare because uh, they've graduated everybody. Really, the prospect I like best left in the minor leagues is Emerson Hancock. Um, in terms of being close to the major leagues and uh, being being useful and also playing well right now. Noel B. Marte is, is exciting, but he's taken a bit of a step back this year. Matt Brash, George Kirby, and Julio Rodriguez are all in the big leagues. I think the next best prospect might be Lazaro Montez, who's, uh, what, 18 years old? Harry Ford, Harry Ford as a, as a catcher, you know, like, is that, is that going to change them around? Cal Riley has been pretty fine. You know, like they catching, they don't seem like they're in that much trouble. So I, I don't think that there's that much more help to come within. And though Matt Brash has been great since he came back up as a reliever, uh, that could be their help uh, from within when it comes to reliever. 
I think I think what I'm saying is I think the help is from coming from within. Mitch Hanniger getting healthy, Matt Brash joining the rotation, and maybe Emerson Hancock, uh, you know, tagging in for George Kirby if there's an inning situation. That's it. That's I think that's all the tricks I got left in my bag. If I'm Jerry, I want to see all these young guys that we graduated make do it, make it happen. You know. No, he's he's pulling rabbits out of his hat. There's, <laughs> I, I have little doubt in my mind. We don't know what kind of rabbit, but it's going to be a rabbit nonetheless. And they're they're going to be active. In I would some guess that, I would guess it's a little bit like what he did last year, where he ends up with somebody that's also going to be on the team next year. Yeah, and maybe that's the right way to play the trade deadline for most teams. There's a handful of exceptions at the very top. The first place teams, front running teams like the Yankees, they don't have to worry about next year as much. But for these middle teams that could still play their way into that position over the final two months or play their way out of it, you still want to have something that makes you better in the long run. So I think that's where even the Mariners and Orioles are, are kind of similar in some strange ways. We should talk about the White Sox for a moment. I got a fun fact for you about the White Sox. No team has an easier strength of schedule for the rest of this season than the White Sox. And at last glance, they were 39.7% chance of making the playoffs. 32.8% chance of winning the AL Central, which speaks to the AL East possibly claiming multiple, if not all, of the wildcard spots. The White Sox are second only to Atlanta among second place teams in terms of their uh, odds of making the playoffs. This is a really strong White Sox team that is just struggling in a big way. And I think the hardest thing for me to figure out if they're going to be buyers, and they reasonably should buy, they're built for now. Who are they trading? They have Colson Montgomery, their first rounder from last year, and Lennon Sosa, who had a breakout at Double A this year, got a brief big league debut, and is now at Triple A Charlotte. Otherwise, they have to live in the bargain bin. Do you think it's possible that the White Sox could maybe borrow a page from Atlanta's trade deadline last year and aim for some of the, hey, we're going to pay these guys, and maybe they're flawed players, but they bring something, the Jock Petersons, the Jorge Soler types, and just get better that way, even if it's not one big splashy move, even if they're not front runners for any of the big names that actually get moved at the deadline. I mean, what would you do in this situation, Britt? Yeah, I don't know, because it seems like all we've been talking about every week is wait till they get healthy, wait till they get healthy. Like, is that enough? Let me hit you with a crazy fact about the White Sox. What if I had told you before the season started that Joe Girardi, Joe Madden, and Charlie Montoya were going to lose their jobs before Tony La Russa. Aye, would, there you go. That's, would you have been like, are you okay, Brittany? Are you, doing, <laughs> are you feeling fine? Um, that's insane. It's absurd, isn't it, to think about? Um, is that a team? That's a team who could make a managerial change. That's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Because if you Sorry. look around the depth chart, like – like where are you going to make a big improvement? Like you've yeah. got really excellent players at every at top, every spot in the depth chart. Lucas Giolito can, can improve. Lance Lynn can improve Josh Harrison. Like, could you have a better second baseman maybe, but is there really going to be a better second baseman available at the trade deadline than the combination of Josh Harrison, Luis, uh, Larry Garcia? I'm not sure. The bullpen is pretty good. It's like everything is there. I have to tell you, and I hate to do this kind of reporting, but the the vibes, the vibes were off, man. I know that's like sounds like really unprofessional, but like I no, was in, read those tea leaves, you know. I know I'm reading the tea leaves. I'm giving you the psychology of the the dugout and the clubhouse, but I it was it was just strange because um, Tony. Uh, uh, like obviously didn't know what was going on. Like, like literally w- things that were happening, did not know what that was happening. Like he was walking one direction and someone had to be like, no, they're having uh, a hitter meeting there. So like, he wasn't aware that there was a hitter meeting going on. Uh, and he was just going to go walk through the middle of it. So, you know, like, and, and then the energy level was, was really, really low and then you have these new reports of, you know, Kenny Williams having meetings and then Tony Russo saying, you know, why are there why are there, you know, un, unsourced quotes in your story about, uh, you know, people not being happy? I don't know, dude, that you really you really think, Tony, that they're going to put their name on it? You know, that you really think that, like, you know, uh, Andrew Vaughn is going to say something to a reporter and be like, yeah, put my name on that. 
Yeah. You know, Put like, my name on this against the guy, Hall of Fame manager. It's not going to see happen. how often I stay, I'm in the lineup next week. You know what I mean? So, uh, it, like, I just did not get the feeling. And then also, when you look at their play, there's a little bit of lackluster play energy, energy wise. They have the worst outfield defensively in, in baseball. But when you look at the players, you're like, you're not all terrible defenders, you know? So, what is the disconnect here? Are, are, are is the R and D staff like is the is the coaching staff not putting you in the right places? Are you not willing to go? You know, are you not willing to like test that hamstring for Tony or for this team because you think it's not doing well uh, and you you guys are out of it? Like what? There's something off with the vibes, and I'm sorry to say that sentence but you, you can tell <laughs> but you can tell watching this team you can feel you can feel it in the booth when jason benetti and steve stone are just kind of beside themselves at the <laughs> oh one decision to put jose ramirez oh on God. base with intentional walk to the audio of down 4-0 with a runner already on second base with two outs and the, what the, on earth and 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 his responses to the media are are, are frankly uh not of the time i have to say they 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 stand for, they come from another time because when 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 he uh, walked trey turner on an 02 count same thing happened early in the season when he intentionally walked him and there was like questions in the press conference he was like do you know what he's hitting with two strikes you know sorry yes we are modern journalists we actually know that we have the numbers and he is not good with two strikes because no hitter is good with two strikes. So sorry, Tony, the numbers do not support your moves here. <laughs> you know what I mean, like, Shifters and it's wildly you, analytics. Yeah. 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 There, yeah. There, there are older Don't managers. You know, I'm the father of. <laughs> yes. There are older managers who are very, very in tune, like fuck in New York. Yeah. Like there's no way he doesn't know about a hitters meeting going on. Right. Right. Um, but there is, yeah, there is definitely that vibe. And they've been booing him. This guy has lasted, I think, much longer than anyone has expected. <laughs> it, it really, to me, is the trade deadline move that the White Sox should make. Get healthy, were, get a new manager. There were White Sox fans that traveled to San Francisco. It seemed just to yell, fire Tony. I was, <laughs> I was hanging out with White Sox fans. And mid sentence, I was talking to a white side fan. He was like, blah, 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 fire Tony, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's like, it's like a, a song. It's like the, the hot song in Chicago where everyone's singing fire Tony. <laughs> hmm, that'd be a great song if someone could actually put it together. I think it would, uh, it would do really well, but. It's sad for White Sox fans that this continues and there's no end in sight. We've had multiple manager firings that were very surprising by comparison, and this one would be the least surprising at all, and it seems like it's somehow just not going to happen. I had a question for both of you about Juan Soto and the Home Run Derby because there were some comments that Juan Soto made recently that made it seem like he believes the Home Run Derby helped in some way last season. He had a huge second half. Juan Soto last year hit 29 home runs. 18 came after the All-Star break, and the team was worse, so there wasn't help around him in the order. He hit 348, 525, 639 after the All-Star break. That's a 199 WRC+. plus. He was 99% better than a league average hitter in the second half, which is just breaking the league. Entering play on Tuesday of this season, Juan Soto, 243, 398, 473, 17 homers in 85 games. The most human version of Juan Soto that we've ever seen, still well above average. I wonder, is this the kind of thing that, for a long time, the home run derby was, hey, it broke this guy. And as Eno has explained, some of that is just normal statistical regression. You were above your skis in the first half. You got selected to participate, and you just regressed back closer to your normal baseline in the second half. It wasn't that taking... 85 hacks as hard as you could in one night actually made you worse. It's just the math of the season working out that way. And then the narrative retroactively being fit, uh, you know, the Bobby Abreu effect or whatever they wanted to call it. But do you believe that the home run derby can actually help a player? Because I thought about this first with Cody Bellinger last week. I thought, Hey, maybe there's a way to fix Cody Bellinger by just having him take a million swings, getting a big crowd behind him and sort of just, getting his confidence back, but the Derby in its current form, while really fun, 
it's to me, it's not like anything else hitters really ever do. Like, is there ever a situation where hitters in the off season when they're in the cage or in batting practice, do they ever work at the same pace that they work at during the current form of the home run derby? I know each of you have seen hitters in a lot of different environments. Is is the home run derby as much of an outlier as I think it is? Yeah. You know, we sat next to each other at the home run derby last year. Remember? Oh, Tommy. Took it all in. Yeah. Took it all in. I won't be there this year, so you're going to have to let me know how it goes. Um, yeah. So Juan Soto spoke a lot about this at last year, too, that he felt relaxed, that just going up there and concentrating on just hitting the ball as hard as he could kind of really kick-started his second half. And so I think we're looking at it less of like a Juan Soto needs to fix his swing because we always hear about guys – getting their swings ruined and all this other stuff. And, or Juan Soto needs to get his timing down. Um, I think he just needs to relax and hit baseballs. And that's what he did last year. That's what he's going to try to do again this year. He seems, or a lot of times this season, it seems like he's pressing. Uh, the guy has more walks than hits. So this is someone who I think would just enjoy getting meatball after meatball and hitting the ball out of the ballpark and hoping that that relaxes him because he's had a lot going on. You know, he's had the extension talks. He's had the trade rumors. This is basically his team now. And so I think, <laughs> Yeah. And so I think for somebody like that, that, yeah, the home run derby could help, you know? I mean, is anyone going to actually beat Pete Alonso, who seems to have the whole thing just figured out? Uh, you know, maybe not. But I think for a guy like Soto to say that, um, it's not super surprising just based off what we saw last year. You know, he's he's never been a – a mechanical guy and overly, um, you know, have to put my foot here and do this guy. He's been a let's shuffle and rely on this natural talent. And I think the home run derby just has a way of kind of bringing that out. Yeah. It, like in terms of a training uh, environment, if that's what you're asking, like it is, I think there are, there are moments when they train like this. Um, there are moments where you just turn the machine up to 95, 96 mile an hour sliders and you fail 85% of the time and you're just swinging, swinging, swinging and sweaty. And yeah, they're definitely training moments where, you know, it's all about hitting the home run. And I think what might toggle for Juan Soto in particular is like there's this delicate tension between the fact that there is the best power outcomes are when you make contact out in front of the plate. It's just a, a truth of 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 physics i think and then you know as a guy with a really good eye um you sometimes let the ball travel and you see that in the fact that soto has great opposite field power um and uh, great opps so you know he i think he has some natural willingness to let the ball travel with the ball the dead and ball you know opposite field power has taken a real step back and then you go into this home run environment where it's I'm pretty like one pitcher was like, they juice the balls. Like they definitely juice the balls. From right I was like, okay, if you say so, I would believe it, you know? Uh, and, and he's like, and it's okay, you know, cause we, that's what we're there to watch. Um, so you get into a situation where the ball flies really well and you're being aggressive. So you could be actually moving your contact point out in front of the plate a little bit. When you get back into games, you become a little bit more aggressive for Soto being a little bit more aggressive might be what unlocks those really hot streaks. Yeah, I mean, in truth, it's probably just as likely to help a player as it is to hurt a player, air quotes, really, on, on both of those. But everyone's a little bit different. If, if you have a, a timing issue that you think you can work out, great. I mean, that's that's something that's fixable, I guess, in, in volume like that. But I, I imagine people are going to look at this and go, oh, this, this is what got Juan Soto back on track in the second half. If his second half this year looks anything like his second half last year did. Uh, but I, also, by the way, every time Pete Alonzo's name comes up around the home run derby, I always wonder if he's friends with Joey Chestnut in real life because they're just two people that just dominate these very specific Strange. events. They're both <laughs> they're just both made for like Joey Chestnut is made for the hot dog eating contest the same way that Pete Alonzo was made to win home run derbies. I can't I can't I can't talk about the. I know, I know. Content. But it do you think they're friends in like real I'm, life? That was the question. Yeah, it does make me a little ill. Uh, mm. it do, yeah, it does make me a little ill. I think so. You know, hundreds of years from now, civilizations will look back on us and be like, "That's what, what they did." <laughs> like they they competed to eat as many hot dogs as they could. It's you know, going to look bad if if there if there is a history it, a thousand years from now, if there's enough still happening on this planet where <laughs> life is sustained a thousand years from now, they will look back at that among 
our worst accomplishments. What do you yes. think an MRI of his gut looks like? Oh, don't want to know. Oh God, that's don't just... want to know, and that's don't awful. want, don't even want emails on the topic. If anyone is a <laughs> no. specialist, keep it to yourself in <laughs> no. this case, because I, I don't need. Are we gonna get a no. well actually email? No. Well, actually, it's... eating hundreds of hot dogs in a two day span is good for you. <laughs> it's actually good for you. Uh, increasing your blood pressure by that much is good because then it, it's a stress <laughs> test for your body, and then it, if you we'll go into fight or flight, then you now. live. No, it's not. <laughs> oh, it's not like God. that at all. On that All note, I think nitrates. it's time to uh, to say goodbye. <laughs> if you'd like to uh, subscribe to The Athletic, you can do that for a dollar a month at theathletic.com slash baseball show. You can find Britt on Twitter at Britt underscore Giroli. You can find Eno at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. The Athletic Baseball Show returns on Friday. At the 3-0 show, you've always got the green light.